Okay, I guess we can get started. Um, good evening and welcome to the June meeting of the North Jersey Astronomical Group. And as Mitchell made a little change of uh, plans for this evening uh, and uh, our speaker could not make it. And so uh, I'm gonna do a presentation here about the Webb Space Telescope, a little update. I've given a talk about this uh, just about a year ago uh, or so. And uh, so um, uh, some of this will be a quick review of uh, the Webb Space Telescope, and but then I've got a whole bunch of new images uh, towards the end that have been released over the past year or so. It was a nice big uh, release of new images last summer, you may recall. And so uh, we'll talk about some of those images and some of the images that have been released since then. Uh, so, um, you know, as you, uh, as many of you know, the uh, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is the most famous of the uh, space telescopes. Uh, everyone knows, well, almost everyone knows its name. Uh, but remember that uh, this was part of a much larger project, which NASA referred to as the Great Observatories. And there were four big solar space telescopes that were part of this program. Hubble was the first. Uh, he had the Spitzer Space Telescope, which did the infrared part of the spectrum. Um, Chandra, which was the X-ray uh, observatory, and then uh, the, the uh, Compton Gamma Ray Observatory uh, did the gamma rays. And so uh, this covered the whole spectrum. And uh, so this was a big uh, innovation to have all these telescopes uh, looking at different parts of the uh, spectrum, in some cases simultaneously. And uh, so uh, a very big project, and uh, Hubble was the most famous, I think, of, of all of those. And uh, today, the telescope is 33 years old. It's uh, amazing <laughs> that a uh, piece of equipment like this can last that long. Uh, but the Hubble and Chandra, the two uh, space telescopes from that original set of four that are still operating. Uh, and so the Hubble is chugging along. Had some problems here and there over the past couple of years, uh, problems with computers and things like that. But uh, uh, NASA's managed to uh, work around those problems. and uh, the, the Telescope continues, uh, very successful. Uh, but now the uh, Webb Space Telescope uh, is, is flying now. Uh, this uh, telescope is a much uh, larger uh, space telescope. And uh, so we'll talk about some of the differences between this uh, and the Hubble. Uh, but this is a project that has been going on for a long time, for 20 years it's taken to get this thing into space. And it's been a giant project. A uh, very expensive uh, project. It took uh, something like 26 years to get this uh, built and launched uh, into space. And so it's been a long, uh, long road, but uh, hopefully this is all going to be, be worth it now that it's uh, in space. And so uh, it's uh, often thought as of as the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, but uh, it's uh, really quite, uh, quite different. And uh, so uh, we can talk about some of the differences between this telescope and Hubble, uh, but I thought I'd mention uh, some of the science that it's going to be focusing on here. Um, one of the uh, big parts of the mission of the Webb Space Telescope is the early universe. Um, you know, we needed a larger telescope that could explore the earliest galaxies and the earliest stars. And that's something we're really, really interested in. And so uh, we want to explore the early universe with this uh, telescope. And of course, we want to know more about galaxies. We'd like to take a closer look at uh, galaxies and uh, see how they changed over time through the history of the universe. And, uh, you know, we've used the Hubble Space Telescope to learn more about the life cycle of stars, how they form. Uh, but uh, the Hubble has some limitations, and so we'd like to know more about how stars form and, and what their life cycles are like. And of course, we're very interested in uh, exoplanets, and so we'd like to explore some of the worlds that are orbiting uh, some of these stars. And so those are, are not the, the only science projects that the telescope will work on, but those are the kind of the four main uh, missions, the four main goals uh, for the scientific mission for Webb Space Telescope. And uh, so, uh, as mentioned, um, you know, these telescopes cover different parts of the spectrum. 
Uh, Hubble focuses on the visible, but goes a little bit into the infrared, a little bit into the ultraviolet. Uh, so uh, some, some nice capabilities. Uh, but if we're going to learn more about these uh, scientific uh, topics we just mentioned, you really need an infrared telescope. And so that's where Webb comes in. Uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope uh, covered some of the uh, far infrared, but that is no longer operating at this point. And so uh, uh, Webb's uh, main focus is going to be on the infrared. Uh, another difference between uh, Webb and Hubble is that Webb is a much larger telescope. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the Hubble Space Telescope is relatively small, only about 95 inches in diameter. The mirror is only 95 inches in diameter. Uh, anybody know why the mirror is 95 inches in diameter? Why would you make it that small? Yeah, that's, that's the largest thing they could fit into the shuttle bay. Uh, that was only heavy lift uh, launcher that we had at the time that was a uh, large size. And so uh, uh, that's how it ended up being 95 inches. It fit into the shuttle bay. Uh, so uh, they wanted something uh, much larger. Uh, and so uh, this is the size in comparison. Uh, you've got the Hubble is uh, two, 95 inches, 2.4 meters. Uh, the Webb uh, Space Telescope mirror is uh, 6.5 meters across. And so uh, that's what, about 21 feet or so in, in diameter. So uh, it's a much larger telescope, um, collects something like seven times more uh, light than the Hubble Space Telescope does. And uh, so um, uh, the overall telescope is fairly large as well, uh, about the size of a tennis court, uh, about um, 70 feet long and um, uh, more than 30 feet wide. Um, most of that is the sun shield, which we'll talk about in a moment here. Uh, but it's a fairly uh, large spacecraft, a large mirror, large spacecraft. And so uh, the problem is, uh, how do you get something this big into a rocket? And uh, so what you have to do is you've got to design an origami spacecraft that's going to fold up and fit inside whatever rocket that you have available to you. And at the time when um, Webb was being designed, the the rocket with the largest diameter uh, was the Ariane 5 uh, that was being developed by the European Space Agency. And so uh, that's how this American spacecraft ended up on a European launcher uh, at the time the largest that was available. And so, uh, so that's what they did. And one of the reasons why this telescope took so long to build and was so expensive to build is that you got this big giant telescope that has a fold up inside of a uh, inside of a rocket. And once it's been launched, it has to unfold, and it's going to do that pretty pretty darn perfectly. Uh, and so um, so, uh, so this is not an easy task, and so here we see the, uh, the optics of the telescope uh, as they're about to undergo some testing. And you can see that 21-foot uh, diameter uh, mirror there. Uh, the uh, Webb Space Telescope uh, has a slightly different uh, design compared to the Hubble. Uh, it's an anti called an anti-stigmat. Uh, it's a three mirror design and it gives you um, a field that's fairly wide and is free of uh, various aberrations. Uh, and uh, it's uh, a little bit off axis too. If you look at the telescope, the secondary mirror is not perfectly centered on the primary mirror. Uh, so it's an interesting design. Uh, the primary mirror is an ellipsoid, and so is the third mirror. Uh, the secondary mirror is a hyperboloid. And so there are these complex uh, curves that they have on these different surfaces in order to uh, give you that nice uh, field of view, nice sharp field of view. And uh, so here's a close-up shot of the mirror itself. And uh, as you can see, 21 feet across, uh, but it's not a single piece. Uh, it's made up of these little um, hexagons. And so you've got uh, a number of different hexagons that uh, fit together. Uh, and uh, you'll notice also that the surface it has a gold color to it. Uh, that's because it is, cold, co it is coated with gold. And that's a really good reflector for infrared energy. And so that's why they use gold 
uh, for, for that. Yeah. Are they adjustable? Yes, yes, they are. And actually, uh, I believe it's the next slide here. I'm just going to show you here's the backside. So if you go back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. What is all the large black beams? Is that the whole the secondary? Oh, yeah. That's this is uh, the secondary uh, is uh, folded up. And so you've got this uh, that's a secondary folded up. There's a secondary mirror on the left hand side. And those long poles are part of the structure that would fold out and puts the secondary mirror in its proper position once the telescope is deployed. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, and if you look at the backside, you can see that each individual uh, mirror segment, uh, there's 18 of them, these, all, these hexagons, and uh, they're about 4.3 feet in diameter, and there are these actuators, these little motors on the back, uh, and they can reposition, they can reshape uh, the uh, individual uh, bits of the uh, of the mirror, individual segments of the mirror, and uh, so uh, the mirror itself and is not a glass mirror. It's uh, beryllium. Uh, it's a beryllium material, so nice and strong and and, and stable, and lightweight uh, as well. And so you get this beryllium mirror, and there's a very thin coating of gold uh, across them to make them uh, very reflective in the infrared part of the uh, spectrum. And uh, the actuators here are able to position the mirror within about 10 nanometers, so about 10 nanometers. So you're talking less than the thickness of uh, human hair. And each, each piece or each segment weighs about 40 pounds or so. So you get 18 of those. Uh, and so you can figure out what the what the weight of the mirror is. It's like much larger than Hubble, but actually lighter in terms of the total weight of it. So very lightweight. And here it is. Uh, they're showing you the um, you know, sort of wings. Uh, the, there's a piece of it that uh, is folded back, and so that's how it gets packed into the rocket with the, the two pieces on either side that folded back, uh, so that it fits into the rocket. And when it's ready for launch. And so <clears throat> once it was launched, uh, where was where is Hubble going to and where is it now? Uh, we just had a presentation about um, about this uh, a couple months ago. Uh, Chris gave us a presentation about uh, Lagrange points. And so these are the uh, Lagrange points that he was mentioning. Uh, these are these nice uh, stable points uh, around the uh, orbit of the Earth. And uh, L2, uh, this spot on the far side of the, uh, of the, uh, the moon's orbit, uh, out beyond, on the opposite side from the sun, uh, this spot out here is a great spot for uh, a telescope like Webb. Um, L1 is a great spot for solar telescopes. You want to point your telescope towards the sun and still have good communications with the Earth. Great spot for solar telescopes. But if you want to put an infrared telescope out there away from the heat of the Earth, um, put it out at L2. And that's a good spot uh, to sit. And it uh, does this little halo orbit. They call it a halo orbit. It's doing this little, uh, little halo orbit uh, around the L2 point. That's a nice stable spot for it to, to be. And it's about about a million miles. Uh, about a million miles out is where the Hubble, or sorry, the uh, the Webb Space Telescope is right now. And uh, since it is an infrared telescope, you know you want to get it out away from the Earth. Uh, L two is great, uh, but you still need to shield the optics and the instruments uh, from whatever heat uh, it's getting from the sun. And so this is the sun shield, the largest part of the uh, spacecraft. As mentioned, it's like something like almost 70 feet long and about 30 feet wide. And this is um, uh, a, um, uh, I'm trying to remember what the material is, um, Kapton. Uh, it's a Kapton material. It's kind of like a mylar type material. And, uh, and there's five layers of it. And this keeps the uh, temperature of the telescope at about negative 370 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and so that's great for infrared observations. What temperature is it on the sun side? Um, 
I don't recall, you know, yeah, I don't recall what, what that is. Uh, I was looking at the, when they first, when they first launched it, uh, they had a nice little graphic where they, you could look that up and see, well, here's the sun side, it's this temperature, and here, here here's what it is on the backside. Uh, but I didn't, when I was looking at the website earlier today, I did not see that up anymore, unfortunately. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what that, what that is. Uh, but it, it probably is fairly high, I would think. A little bit further out than the further away from the sun than the moon is, but uh, yeah, it, it's probably fairly high, I would, I would guess. Uh, so, um, so this is what the uh, deployment uh, would have looked like, and uh, here's the um, telescope during its um, testing and building phase. I believe this is Goddard Space Flight Center, if I remember correctly. And oops, I think they were. Well, so here it is, kind of folded up. So there it is all, all packed up together and gets into the rocket, is launched. And over a two week period, it has to unfurl. And so it does so you know, one step at a time. Starts with the solar panels, obviously, for power. And it deploys an antenna for communications with the Earth. Two, and so just step by step, here we go. Unfolding everything. Here comes the sun shield. And since the spacecraft is located almost a million miles away from Earth, it's got to do this flawlessly because if something gets stuck and some little widget doesn't pop in the right place. You're out of luck. <laughs> you know, because the astronauts can't just go out and give it a kick. So, the layers of the sun shield unfolding the various components, deploying. And during the actual deployment, um, it, it pretty much pretty much went perfectly. I think they had maybe a little bit of a problem with the sun shield, but in the end, they got it, got it all set up. Well, after about a week, almost a week goes by, and then the sun shield is finally fully deployed. I was kind of surprised at the time when they actually started unfurling this thing so quickly. Yeah. All you could think of is something something coming through space and running right through the, yeah. Yeah. the heat shield. Yeah. Uh, well, certainly, I guess it, I guess it was after they did their deployment. Well, there goes the secondary mirror. You see the secondary mirror unfolding there. And uh, the primary mirror should be next. There it is in the wings folding forward. I think I think what they did have an impact on the primary mirror, at least one, at well, least more than one. And I think that was after they actually reached the L point, I think, at that stage. And so nobody was to where's web website. Yeah. Uh, so you could see where yeah. it was supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, you could track it as it's going out. And so that well, the whole deployment uh, process, as I said, was really successful. And the Ariane launch was really great. There was perfect uh, launch, and so they saved a lot of fuel. So I think they estimated that uh, the web has at least 20 years of fuel, possibly. They could operate for 20 years in the fuel that, that they have on board. Yeah. What is it, what is it orbiting? 
Uh, it's not orbiting anything. It's, it's, just, it's kind of a stable spot where the gravity of the Earth and the Sun and the Moon are kind of kind of balanced out to a certain extent. And so you can put it in this little parking orbit and it's just kind of orbiting around a point in space and you can use minimal fuel to keep it in that parking orbit. You know? So it's just a nice, nice spot to be in. You know? And so this is what it looked like on the launch pad. I was getting ready for launch, and then the actual launch took place on Christmas Day, 2021. And so, as I said, it's a very successful and precise launch, saved a lot of fuel. And there's just a little overview of the whole deployment process, which, as mentioned, took, took about two weeks to deploy everything. So, this was really very nice, um, very nice deployment. And uh, this was kind of amazing. This is one of the very first uh, images that was released. And this is just a, simply a telescope alignment. They were trying to see, you know, how well the mirrors are aligned. And even this, in this very quick um, exposure, you can see galaxies off in the background, all these little dots off in the background are galaxies. And so that kind of shows you the uh, capabilities of this telescope are pretty, pretty amazing, uh, even with a short exposure. How long was this for uh, This, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure how long this one was. It wasn't very long at all. And they're pointed at a pretty bright star here. I don't know what star they used to as a target, as their first target. But they were pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. Right? What's that? I think that, that image was just a test. Yeah, it was yeah, just, just a test to see the optics were lined up per perfectly. And that took a while. You know, They were working on that for quite a few Quite a while, uh, like last the, the year. Well, it was it was a spring. They were kind of working on it all spring with little tweaks because they, you know, uh, aligned it with one instrument, then they go to another instrument and align that one, and you know, instrument by instrument they go through and make sure everything was lined up properly, and uh, that went uh, really well. And so this is the uh, the instruments that are on board. Uh, there are four main instruments for Webb Space Telescope. Uh, you've got uh, near spec. Oh, which is near a near infrared uh, spectro spectrograph. Uh, Neris is a near near infrared imager, but also a slitless spectrograph. So you can do big spectrum of multiple uh, objects at the same time. Uh, near cam is kind of the basically the, the main instrument for the imaging uh, camera. Uh, and then you have the mid infrared near you, the mid infrared instrument was look at the middle range of the uh, longer wavelengths of infrared energy. And so these are the four main instruments for uh, the space telescope. And uh, as mentioned, the um, science that um, we want to do with this, um, we want to look at the uh, earliest galaxies, the earliest um, stars that we can find. So this is the um, uh, Hubble view field here. I'll show you a web version of this uh, pretty soon. Uh, here as we get towards the, um, the new images. Um, so this is, um, you know, kind of a very neat uh, feature of our universe, uh, sometimes called uh, look back time or cosmic time. Uh, it's kind of, you know, it's like having access to a time machine. Um, it takes time for light to reach us from the furthest parts of the universe. And in some cases for the very furthest galaxies, that stuff has been traveling for more than 13 billion years. And so uh, it's taken 13 billion years for that light to reach us. And so when you look further out towards, uh, towards the sort of edge of the universe here, uh, you're looking further and further back in time. And so you're seeing galaxies that are younger and younger, you know, closer and closer to the Big Bang. The Big Bang is off over here somewhere, 13.8 billion uh, years ago. And uh, so that's what we're trying to explore here, the very earliest parts of the history of the universe. And that's a section that the Hubble can't quite reach. It's not really quite big enough. And uh, you can't quite reach far enough into the infrared part of the spectrum to look at this part of the universe. And so this is what the Webb uh, Space Telescope is looking at, at these very furthest galaxies. And this is why we need an infrared telescope for this kind of work, because uh, this light, as it's traveling towards us, you know, the universe is expanding uh, as time is going on. And so the light is kind of stretched, or light waves are stretched out and redshifted 
And so a lot of that light is shifted way off down into the infrared part of the spectrum. And so if you want to look at some of these early galaxies, that's the part of the spectrum that you want to be looking in to find these earliest galaxies. And so uh, certainly the um, Hubble Space Telescope has um, been exploring uh, galaxies and shown some amazing stuff over the years. Uh, we've learned a lot about galaxies using the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, but we'd like to know more. And uh, remember that there are you know, three basic uh, types of galaxies that we see out there. Uh, spiral galaxies like the Milky Way, of course, uh, elliptical galaxies, these kind of big um, spherical or football shaped galaxies that are out there. And of course you have these irregular galaxies that are kind of, uh, kind of scrambled up a little bit. And so those are the three basic types of galaxies that we see uh, out there. And of course, our Milky Way is a spiral uh, type of a galaxy. And uh, one thing that Hubble's been really spectacular at is um, looking at uh, these galaxy collisions. Uh, this is something that is uh, very common in the universe. Uh, we see these kind of galaxy collisions all over the place. And um, it is a big part uh, of how galaxies change over, over time. It's how you make a galaxy like the Milky Way through mergers and collisions. And so, so we have these really amazing uh, images from the Hubble Space Telescope, that are really quite amazing. And uh, of course, um, with the, the Hubble and other telescopes as well, we've been discovering that a lot of these galaxies have supermassive black holes at the center of them. And so uh, here's an image not from Hubble or Webb, this is a uh, radio telescope image that was released uh, just about a year ago, if I remember correctly. Uh, this is the Milky Way. This is the supernova black hole that's at the center of the Milky Way. So this is about 4 million suns uh, at the center of the Milky Way, about 30,000 light years away from us. And so this is the, only the second time they've ever been able to image a black hole like this. Uh, the other one was, uh, I believe, M87, I believe was the first one, uh, just the, pre the prior, previous year, I think. And so um, so this is the first um, image of the Milky Way's uh, supermassive black hole. And it seems this is very, very common. There's like lots of black holes at the centers of galaxies. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of them are hidden. Uh, they're down inside the core of galaxies and where there tends to be a lot of gas and dust. And so if you want to explore this uh, this type of a thing uh, you need some infrared light you need some long infrared light to penetrate some of that dust and gas and uh, of course as we uh, have been learning more about uh, the universe uh, it seems that um, a lot of it is not visible to us uh, we've been learning quite a lot about that over the past um, 20 30 years and it seems like uh, of the matter in the universe, 80% of it is unknown. Uh, it's this dark matter. Uh, and uh, we don't really know what it is. It's uh, very strange and uh, kind of embarrassing that we don't know what 80% of the matter in the universe is made of. Uh, it could be some kind of uh, particle. Uh, but fortunately, even though we can't uh, see it, we can map it. And so this is a map of a um, galaxy cluster. And by looking at the motions of these uh, galaxies, you can map out this kind of white, hazy material that you see all around. This is where the dark matter is located in, in this galaxy cluster. And so even though we can't see it, we don't know what it is, we can measure its effects uh, by looking at things like galaxy clusters and things like that. So we can explore dark matter as well with these space telescopes. And of course, our Milky Way, you know, when you go outside, especially on a nice um, summer night, uh, you look up at that beautiful Milky Way going across the sky, uh, you'll notice that it's very dusty and lots of gases that are blocking our view, uh, especially in the summertime when you're looking towards uh, Sagittarius and uh, Scorpius. Uh, the core of the galaxy is somewhere down in there and uh, it's gotten hidden with a lot of gas and dust. And so uh, if you want to explore uh, the, uh, some parts of these galaxies, you need some infrared light to cut through that, that gas and dust. 
and um, see as much as we can. And uh, of course, the stars, another focus of the Webb Space Telescope is to learn more about the, uh, the origins of stars, how do stars form? And uh, you, of course, will recall uh, this famous image from the Hubble Space Telescope. This is the famous pillars of creation. And so you have these enormous pillars of gas, and inside those pillars are young stars that are forming. And uh, again, infrared light will let us penetrate some of those gases and take a closer look at these young stars. Uh, likewise, the uh, Orion uh, Nebula is one of them, probably one of the most uh, massive um, star forming regions in our area, our region. And um, Hubble has found, I believe it's 1200 young stars that are forming inside of the Ryan Nebula. And so um, I don't think I've seen any images uh, from Webb of the Ryan, of Ryan Nebula quite yet. Uh, so I'm sure that they will probe this area, but I haven't seen any images yet from that. So Kevin, do you yes. think the Webb will be able to see those little protoplanetary purples? Yeah, I would think so. That's what the other kind of call it. They're, they're those little insects there, these are the little proplids, these little bubbles of gas around young stars. And so, yeah, I would think they'd be able to penetrate at least some of that. Have know. they done those yet? I haven't heard anything. If they have, um, they haven't released any of those, you know. Uh, I assume that uh, they have a similar, I, I assume they have a similar plan in, in place as the Hubble, if you're doing research with the telescope that uh, you can hold on to some of those images for up to a year. You know, there's like an embargo, like if you wanna hold on to your images, you can hold on for up to a year, but uh, that's the, so you have a year to do your research, you know, but after that time period, then it becomes public. Uh, so some of, them are, some of them are really straight away, depends on what the, the team that uh, is working on that particular image, uh, what they wanna do with it. Some of them are released a lot earlier than that. But maybe, maybe they've been taken, but haven't been released yet. So that's a possibility. And of course, exoplanets. We've been discovering lots and lots of exoplanets using various methods with uh, ground-based telescopes and space telescopes. The Kepler Space Telescope um, uh, did a lot of work uh, for a number of years, uh, discovering lots of exoplanets. Uh, and that uh, mission has ended. And now there's the TESS spacecraft, the TESS satellite. Uh, uh, transit, um, what does that stand for again? Um, transiting tra exoplanets, yeah. survey satellite. Survey satellite, right. Uh, transiting exoplanets. And so looking for a little mini transits, just like Kepler did. And so that's continuing the mission of Kepler. And uh, I checked the uh, NASA website uh, this afternoon, and they are up to uh, 5,347 exoplanets confirmed. Plus 10,000. Candidates. Right, yeah, yeah, over 10,000 candidates that haven't been confirmed yet, but uh, definitely 5,000 that have been, been confirmed as, as exoplanets. So How do they define exoplanets? Uh, just uh, simply something that is orbiting another star and is not is not a star, not big enough to be a star or a brown dwarf, which we'll mention in a moment, but uh, something big enough to see. Yeah, yeah. So something that's exactly. less than 12, 12 Jupiters, I think, something like that. Anything that's less than 12 Jupiters is uh, basically a planet, more, more or less. And uh, so, and um, yeah, so uh, we, uh, you know, uh, when we're looking at, um, we're looking at these early stars, uh, well, it just seems that, you know, planetary formation is a part of the natural process of star formation. Uh, we see a lot of stars with these disks around them, and uh, in those disks are um, exoplanets, or forming exoplanets. And I've got a, this is an artist rendition. I haven't actually have a real image that I can show you as well. And uh, of course, everyone wants to know, well, how many of these planets have life? Uh, right now, uh, we know of 63, 63 worlds that are potentially habitable. That doesn't mean they are, or they have life. Uh, and everyone wants to know, well, is there another Earth out there? NASA sometimes 
refers to that as Earth 2.0. You know, where's Earth 2.0? Well, we haven't found it yet. Uh, here's some interesting candidates. Uh, some of these are artists and dishes made a little fanciful. They had lots of water on the surface, but we don't know if that's really the case. Uh, but here we go. Uh, uh, something around Proxima Centauri. Uh, so this is only uh, 4.2 light years away from us. And a whole bunch of them are 11 or 12 light years away from us. So uh, lots of planets in our, in our neighborhood uh, orbiting some of these nearby stars. And so um, the uh, Webb Space Telescope is big enough uh, that it can look at the atmospheres of these uh, objects and try to discover whether or not there's a, an Earth 2.0 out there. And so um, I mentioned the, the instruments that are on board. Uh, there's a couple of um, spectrographs on board. And so uh, this is kind of a basic idea of how a spectrograph works. Uh, you've got light coming in from a star or a distant uh, exoplanet that uh, passes through a slit uh, it's a grading, so you have this little grading, kind of imagine a, uh, uh, if you've got a little DVD around or a CD around, look at the back side of it, it's nice and rainbowy. Uh, that's uh, because of the, the grading on the, the, the lines on the disc itself are, are close enough together, they start to split up light into their colors, and so the detector can uh, collect this information, you can see the spectrum, and that's like a fingerprint, you can figure out what kind of chemicals are there in the atmosphere or on the surface of this particular exoplanet. And uh, so they've started to do that. And so uh, if you wanna find uh, Earth 2.0, you wanna look something like this. So if you were an alien creature uh, looking at Earth, what would the spectrum of Earth look like? It would look something like this. You've had some nice carbon dioxide spikes, uh, some ozone, methane, you've had lots of water vapor in the atmosphere, more ozone over here and lots of carbon dioxide on the upper part of the uh, spectrum there, lower part of the spectrum. And so you want to look for something like this, probably, if you want to find an Earth 2.0, um, at least we know what kind of signature to, to look for. And uh, so here's um, K218b uh, orbiting around a red dwarf star. I don't uh, recall off the top of my head how far away uh, this is from us, but um, it's um, one of the first, it's not the only, but it's one of the first ones that they found uh, water vapor in the atmosphere. So that's really exciting. Um, 124 light years away, 124 light years. So not near, near close, but you know, not too far either. And uh, so, um, so I think there's a couple of these right now. I mean, a couple of exoplanets at this point have, that have had water vapor uh, found in their atmosphere. So that's kind of, kind of interesting. Perhaps at one point, you know, uh, Webb will pick up something that, that looks more like Earth. Or the test site will pick up something that's more like Earth. Uh, another area of research we just kind of mentioned in passing, uh, you know, if you've got a planet that is, that's, um, bigger than about 12 Jupiters or so, uh, you kind of have something that's no longer really just a planet, but yet it's not a star. It's not big enough for fusion to start. And some of the bigger, brown, these are called brown dwarfs, and some of the bigger ones, you get a little bit of fusion happening there, but they don't really complete the process. Uh, and they're, they're warm, uh, but yet they're not really stars. And so these are kind of failed stars. And so that's something they're, uh, you know, very, very exceedingly dim, but they're putting off some infrared energy. And so Webb is really good for that. Webb is really good for uh, discovering uh, brown dwarfs. And we really like to know what the dividing lines are. Really 12 Jupiters, where's the dividing line between a brown dwarf and a planet? And what's the difference between, a, where's the dividing line between a big brown dwarf and a small star? You know, like that nailed some of those things down a little bit more precisely. And Webb's gonna go for that. Yeah. Oh, one of the things that may um, differentiate uh, the, the star and a big brown dwarf, is what are the processes that we think are going on inside of each? Yeah. And, uh, the brown dwarf may have a iridium in there, uh, but may not have enough for uh, Fusion, 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think I think some of the, the bigger ones will, will actually burn deuterium. Deuterium. Okay. You know, they'll start to fuse that. But it's it right? doesn't really go through the whole proton proton chain that a right. star does. And so it kind of sputters along and is creating some heat there, but not a whole lot of light. And so they're real dim and real tough to find. Uh, but so it's not something Webb would, would prob will probably excel at looking at those types of objects. And when you're looking for whether it's exoplanets or brown dwarfs, um, it's real tough to, to look for these objects uh, because they're so much dimmer than their stars. And so uh, at least one, if not two of the instruments on board Webb have coronagraphs built into them. And so what is a coronagraph? Well, basically it's, a, it's an artificial eclipse. And so you can take something, uh, whether it's a round disc or a bar or something and stick it in front of a star, block the star of the star's light, all that allows you to see the dimmer planets and um, round dwarfs that might be orbiting around it. And so that's how a coronagraph really works is kind of uh, an artificial eclipse that you can create in, inside the instrument. And that's one way of searching for, for these. Uh, plus you can also look for these mini eclipses as the planet or object passes in front of the star, you're gonna get this little mini eclipse and the light is gonna fade out for a little bit. And so, uh, so that's what um, Webb is working on at this point. And uh, so uh, let me show you um, a few of the brand new images. Uh, and uh, we can start out in our own solar system. Uh, here's a really nice shot of Jupiter uh, in the infrared. And uh, so um, you get a real nice uh, view of uh, the aurora at the poles, the auroras at the poles, and this shot of the uh, great red spot there. You can even pick out the, uh, the very, very faint dust ring uh, around it. <clears throat> and so you get this nice view of. What does aurora detraction? Uh, I think this is, uh, I think the, the aurora actually was so bright that it was just. I guess it was kind of bouncing around in the instrument maybe a little bit, you know, because it seems to have a little bit of a glare there, you know, around the uh, aurora, both top and bottom. I think it's the top, well, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but on my screen, I can see there's another kind of glare on top there too. Uh, so it might've just been very bright at the time. And uh, so here's a close-up shot of the uh, cloud tops in the infrared, and so um, real nice, real nice detail, you know, real nice detail. Uh, here's Titan, uh, biggest moon of Saturn. Uh, this is a, on the one side, on the left side, you've got a web uh, image that was taken with the Mirkan in November of last year. And you can see some nice detail, some clouds. Uh, we've got a, a dark region here, uh, sort of a large dark area uh, that, um, you know, it's, you've got the surface is really quite interesting. It's got rivers, lakes, even sea, seas of methane and ethane on the surface. And uh, Bellet, this uh, we've mentioned, uh, uh, labeled this dark area called Bellet. And that's an area where they just have these very dark sand dunes, the big sand dunes going across this particular area. And so um, very, very cool image. Uh, the one on the right is a combination of information from the Keck telescopes up in Hawaii and uh, information from uh, the near cam as well. And you combine them together and you get this really nice image um, just a few days later. And so you can see the some slight changes between the first and second images here as the clouds move across uh, through the atmosphere of Titan. So really nice, really nice view of Titan, especially when it's, you know, at this point it's what, uh, almost a billion miles from Earth at this point, you know, so it's pretty good, pretty good from a billion miles away. Uh, here's Uranus uh, from earlier this year, in Feb back in February, they took this shot of uh, Uranus and a couple of its moons. And if we zoom in here, you get a nice view of the rings. Beautiful shot of the rings. And you even see, can see clouds 
in the atmosphere of Uranus, which is really quite uh, quite amazing. Um, when it comes to Uranus and Neptune, you know, um, you don't have any very many detailed shots like this uh, because it's it's real difficult to, to get these objects from uh, Earthbound infrared telescopes have been monitoring these planets uh, since the Voyager spacecraft flew, flew, flew through past. Uh, what was the last uh, Voyager encounter it was 1989, maybe, or Neptune, I think. Yeah. And so uh, we have had no close-up images since then, uh, just some, some ground-based uh, infrared stuff. And so this is really Really nice. You can monitor now the you know, now that the web is flying. You can monitor the weather on Uranus and Neptune much more frequently, I think, than we have in the past. And so it's that's great. I mean, this, this is a web image. Yes, this is this is web. Yeah, this is definitely a web image you close up shot. We think the, the inter infrared image uh, will pick up the dust, the finer dust in the rings. Yeah, a little better than than the visible light. Yeah, yeah. So you get some nice detail. Of, there was faint inner zeta ring. Mm -hmm. It's apparently very, very tough to spot, um, except with spacecraft. And so that comes out fairly, fairly well here. Uh, so, um, so Voyager, actually Voyager, last time Voyager, uh, we had a spacecraft at uh, Uranus was 1986. So <laughs> that was quite, quite a long time ago. Yeah. So Neptune, speaking of which, here's a nice uh, wide field shot of Neptune with a nice little spiral down the lower left hand corner, a nice little spiral galaxy off in the background there. Uh, but there's uh, Neptune with its rings. I just want to zoom in, a little cropped image. So you've got uh, Voyager, as mentioned, 1989 was the last encounter. Uh, Hubble Space Telescope does a pretty nice job. Uh, well, this is one of the latest images from 2021. And then compare that uh, to um, to the Webb Space Telescope from late last year. And so, uh, again, you can see some nice uh, details in terms of the clouds and the ring structure. It comes out pretty nicely in the infrared. So, uh, again, a nice, nice way to monitor the weather on these outer planets. A lot of planetary science, all scientists are really leaving for uh, another spacecraft to go out. It's a long trip, and we have to find money to do that. But uh, it would be really cool if we can get our spacecraft out there. But in the meantime, we've got Webb to help us monitor the weather on these planets. And uh, so, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, they're doing lots of research on uh, exoplanets. And so here's a nice uh, spectrum of an exoplanet. Uh, doesn't have a name, just a catalog number, VHS. 1256b. And uh, so uh, if you take a look, uh, you've got quite a lot of interesting things here. Lots of the signs of water, uh, methane, carbon monoxide, some methane, silicates, and even more water. So uh, lots of uh, well, very nice uh, kind of result here from this particular uh, exoplanet. So like I said, maybe at some point we'll find some kind of uh, uh, some kind of uh, Earth type planet out there. Uh, let's see. Um, <clears throat> this is an artist. Uh, oh yeah, this is an illustration of what this planet might look like. Uh, mass is about twenty Jupiters. Uh, rotation is about uh, twenty-two hours. So similar to Jupiter, but much bigger about 40 light years away from us, so not too far. Uh, here's Phobohalt, um, nice uh, bright star in the uh, southern sky in the fall. And here's a beautiful shot of a disc around uh, Phobohalt. Now, this is not the first time that something like this has been imaged, but this is, the, I think, the greatest amount of detail that we've ever captured. And so really interesting, we've got uh, uh, inner, inner disk of material, which I don't think they've uh, ever seen before. As, and then notice the gaps. And this gets the planetary scientists really excited. And they see gaps, and that means there could be planets yes. orbiting uh, in those regions. And 
this uh, this little knot here, you can see really carefully, there's a little knot in one of these rings, uh, and that's uh, called the Great Dust Cloud. And uh, you know, a, a few years ago, uh, they announced that they had discovered a planet orbiting around the FOMO. But it turns out that was a little bit of a mistake. It was something like this. I don't know if it was the same thing, but it was something like this, where something probably collided in the in the disk and you know, did this big explosion of dust uh, due to this collision. And that's what appeared. And they thought it was a planet, but then maybe a year or two later, they looked again, I think we were using the Hubble Space Telescope, and it had disappeared because it was a cloud of dust, not a planet. Mm -hmm. And so this seems to be a very active uh, planetary disk here. So this could be forming planets um, even as we speak. Uh, this is only about uh, 25 light years away, uh, about uh, two solar masses, so this is twice as big as the sun, uh, only about uh, between 100 and 300 million years old, so fairly young. And so um, very, very interesting system. Not too far away from us. Uh, speaking of young stars, uh, here's a really spectacular uh, image of a uh, of a protostar. Uh, this is L1527. Uh, L1527. And uh, this is a, a great image. Uh, this is only about 100,000 years old. And it's going to cocoon in all this gas and dust. Uh, if you look very carefully, right at the center where the protostar is, you notice it looks like a bar going across the middle of it there. That little sort of hourglass shape. Right down there is a little bar. That's the disk. That's one of those, just like Omaha, the disk, but it's almost edge on. And so you see this little this kind of slice across the, uh, uh, across the nebula. And so that's what we're seeing here. So you're seeing um, light kind of pouring out of this young star, but it's being blocked by the disk. And so this is all being blocked and you see the light pouring out the poles north and south. So that gives it this kind of distinctive hourglass shape to it. And so it's very, um, very pretty uh, little image of a protostar. You ever wonder, wonder what a baby baby star looks like? This is, this is what it looks like. Yeah, kind of cool. And here's uh, Webb's version of the Pillars of Creation. So that uh, image from the Hubble, and uh, you can see that the with the infrared uh, makes uh, some of the parts of the cloud transparent, and so you can kind of see a little bit more detail inside of this cloud. There's the Webb's version of that. Let's see. I think there's another. There's a slightly different. This might be the um, the mirror. This might be the mid infrared uh, part of the spectrum. Uh, so um, this is about um, 6,500 light years away from us. This is inside the uh, Eagle Nebula. And uh, the cool thing about the, uh, the pillar pillars of creation is that you don't need a space telescope to see them. Uh, you can certainly, I don't know if you, Mark, have you ever seen them visually, the Pillars of Creation? Uh, through David Rossiter's 25 minutes. Yeah, big big telescope. You've got a big telescope. You can see it visually, but yeah. it isn't too hard to the image. No. You know? It's surprisingly, no, images, surprisingly yeah. easy to, to image. So you the can image, image yeah. this and see same thing with the space telescope. See, but uh, this obviously is a more greater, visually, greater we, detail. We did need an oxygen free filter, though. Oh, okay. Right. okay. Even, even visually, filter. though. Yeah. 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 Right. What kind of dimensions are going um, I, I don't recall. Um, uh, okay, if we go back, do they, you know, sometimes they put a little scale on it for us, uh, but I don't see that. Um, so yeah, I'm not quite sure what the scale of this uh, is. Um, go back. Yeah. yeah, this is, um, yeah. here I think this is the near infrared, I believe. So this is the near, probably the near cam. Yeah. So there's one little piece mm -hmm. that sticks out from the neck of the 
upper one yep. is going up yep. Yep. that little bit. Look yep. how different it is in the next picture. Okay, let's go forward. Wow. Yeah, it's a little bit, uh, it's a, this looks like a little crop, the uh, mid right there. So, I don't know. <laughs> that's something yeah. interesting well, going on there. Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. Right. I don't know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> that's that kind of cool. Face on this one? No. Yeah. Like an old man. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the uh, pillars of creation. Here's a side by side view uh, Hubble on the left and Webb on the right. <laughs> Yeah, this, that's that. Is that what we're looking at? That little piece yes. there? Mm -hmm. yeah, so we're looking at this little knob here. Looks like this in the Hubble. And so you can see more detail in the web image than we can see in the Hubble image. And the, on the second one from the left, there's a star at the wrist. It is not in the Hubble picture at all. So up, 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 stop. No, down a bit. Okay. To your left. See that that, star there? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, we don't it's see it here. Yeah. obscured in the other one. Yeah, unless you have obscured by gas in that one. So, mm -hmm. actually, down here, too, there's another one. Yes. You don't really see that over here. A lot more stars in the web image is much more transparent. Mm -hmm. So, uh, interesting side by side image. Uh, so here's the um, Carina Nebula. Uh, this one's marked. You can see uh, this little bar down the bottom is two light years across. So it gives you a sense of the scale here. Uh, so this is just a little chunk of the Carina Nebula. Um, I think uh, this is often referred to as the cosmic cliffs of Carina. So this is just one section of a much larger nebula. Uh, this is uh, about 7,000 light years away from us. And uh, so you have uh, stars kind of out, off the edge of the, above the edge of the frame here that are kind of bombarding this part of the nebula with light. And you can see that the gases are almost like they're evaporating, kind of wafting off the uh, surface of the nebula here. So it's kind of eroding away some of these gases and ionizing some of the gases here. So, um, and that kind of pressure from um, these other stars can perhaps make the gases in here collapse and form even more stars. So kind of a chain reaction kind of, kind of thing going on here. Uh, here's a nice shot of the Tarantula Nebula. Uh, this is a, and the, this particular image is about 340 light years across from one side to the other. Uh, this is part of the large melogenetic cloud, uh, 160,000 light years away from us. Uh, and um, so it's one of the largest, uh, brightest star forming regions that we know of uh, in our kind of neighborhood. And so you see all these massive stars of the sense, uh, star cluster, a uh, cluster of young stars in the center, and they're pouring light out into the nebula. You can see the Maybe it was kind of being pushed back, pushed away from the young cluster. And again, this can cause other stars to form in these particular regions around it. So massive star forming region. Uh, here is um, uh, a star called WR124. Uh, about 15,000 light years away. And this is an incredibly massive star. Uh, it's uh, called a, a Wolf Rayart, Rayart star. And so this could go supernova at some point. Yeah, <laughs> it kind of does. Uh, but, you know, it's ejected some of its gases and not really, it's not really uniform. So it's kind of puffed off some of its gases as it reaches the end of its, of its life. Uh, this is about 30 times the mass of the sun. So when this goes, it's going to go boom. Yeah. So uh, it's, uh, and the, they, they estimated that the star at this point has already shed about 10 solar masses. 
originally was much, it was even more massive than, than the sun. And it's already shed 10 solar masses now left with about 30. So this is a star about to go boom. Supernova. How far away is that? Um, that is uh, 15,000 light years old. So fortunately, now not anything you have to worry about. You know, so when it does go off, <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. 30 solar masses, so that will become a black hole then. Yeah. 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 Very likely there would be a, be a black hole. Yeah. So it all together started with 40? Yeah, it started 30, with 40. Plus yeah. the 10 that the 30 shed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So that's pretty, pretty, pretty big. It's a giant star. Uh, this, I think, is one of my favorite images that come out from the web. Uh, this was released last summer. Uh, this is the Southern Ring, uh, the Southern Ring Nebula, which we can't see, unfortunately, from New Jersey. It's too far south. Uh, and uh, so this is a sun like star about uh, 25, or was a sun like star about 2,500 light years away. And so it's ejected some of the outer layers uh, as it becomes a white dwarf star. And you can see that it's not symmetrical. You know, we have the nice. Um, Ring nebula in the northern hemisphere, M57, which is nice and symmetrical. You get a nice little round um, sort of ring of gas. Uh, this one's not quite as neat as the ring nebula in the northern hemisphere. Uh, it's a little asymmetrical because this is a multiple star system. And so that's kind of changed things a little bit. And the nebula is about one light year across at this point. So it's expanded out to about one light year. Do they know which stars are part of the system? Um, yeah, and um, I, I was reading the caption that they provided for this, and it was hard to understand which one was which. Which they had, which they had marked the ones that were part of the system because I was trying to read the caption. I couldn't figure out which which star they were really referring to. I think the one that's towards the middle is not really uh, the white dwarf star. Yeah. It's either a foreground star or a background star. I'm not sure which. It's not that one, unfortunately. Uh, here's another um, Sigma supernova. Uh, this is uh, Cas A, Cassiopeia A, constellation Cassiopeia. Uh, fantastic uh, supernova uh, remnant located in Cassiopeia. Uh, if you had looked at this area of the sky back in about 1630, 1640, uh, you would have seen a massive star here. And uh, now, well, today, hundreds of years later, when you look at it, you just see this big expanding cloud of, of gas. And it's a bit of a mystery uh, because it seems like no one see, saw it go off. No one saw the supernova go off. Uh, there are no real clear records of it. Um, it's about 11,000 light years away. So perhaps when it went supernova, they, someone estimated that it went supernova in 1667. 16, 16, but then it doesn't mean very much in the way of records of a new star appearing in Cassiopeia and so right by So it. yeah, I mean, uh, you, you think that people would have seen it, you know, but so I guess the suspicion is that and we had glasses by then. Yes, we did. Yeah. 16. Even a telescope by then. Yeah, even we had a telescope. We had telescopes, small ones. Uh, but perhaps I think there was some speculation that I heard that uh, Maybe the it was hidden by by gas or dust or something, and it just didn't seem didn't didn't notice it somehow. Somehow they missed it, the early observers. And so, um, so there's a uh, Cassiopeia A, beautiful. Uh, oh, notice the uh, you know they, of course this is a false color uh, image, uh, and you'll notice there's one section of the nebula where they colored it sort of the greenish colored. It's a little bit shorter wavelength uh, than the other parts of the nebula. And so they use green, and uh, the uh, astronomers call this the big the green, big green monster after the uh, Fenway Park. There's a big wall in Fenway Park in Boston. And so they call it the big green monster. Um, and if you look carefully, I don't know if you can see this on the projector, but uh, notice that there are little voids, little bubbles here inside the nebula. and um, they don't know what those are. <laughs> they don't know what uh, causes that. Right? I don't think it's uh, something they really, really have seen before. So that's kind of interesting. I don't have to figure that out. Uh, so, Chris, uh, galaxies are a big area of uh, research. And so you have a, a gorgeous wide field view uh, with um, hundreds of distant galaxies, but you've got a couple of nice 
the spiral galaxies here in the foreground as well. So a beautiful shot with a pretty picture there of lots of, of galaxies. And uh, here's a close-up shot of M74. Uh, so this is something that is fairly well known to amateur astronomers. Uh, 32 million light years away in the constellation Pisces. Uh, it is a face-on galaxy, as you can see, and so sometimes it's nicknamed the phantom galaxy. So it's kind of a low surface brightness, and so it's sometimes hard to spot if you don't have dark skies. Uh, and so this is a nice uh, infrared uh, image. Uh, there's also a combination image uh, taking the uh, Hubble uh, Hubble Space Telescope and the uh, let me shrink down the shrink down the box there so we can see combination of both uh, oh Hubble and Webb sorry this is the center one of the combination of the two. So there's the web image, a beautiful view from the Hubble, combine them together to make the center image. What do you think happened in that lower left dark surface? You know, look at that. <laughs> Giant void. Uh, it shows I mean, up here. Yeah, it shows up pretty, you know, pretty much here in the center image, but off on the right, yeah, that's a gigantic void. Uh, I don't know, could it be, you know, a super, could it be a supernova, but it, that's a huge, just, that's a huge section of uh, of a galaxy. It's gigantic bubble. So. What would longer wavelengths just pass through? Yeah. Yeah. You know, think about it. Because so. you could see the cloud, the, what you call it, the, um, the spiral arm right there, yeah. kind of yeah. looks, you know, not interesting, and then but over here it does. Yeah, yeah. See, there's one of the spiral lines goes right to this area. Yeah. So yeah, it's kind of weird. <laughs> is that being blocked or is it passing through? Mm. That's the question. Mm. Uh, so let's see. This is um, NGC thirteen sixty five. Um, it's known as a barred spiral, uh, which is similar to the Milky Way. It's also a barred spiral. You have kind of elongated bar going across the center of the galaxy and the spiral arms are kind of attached to that bar. So this is... Um, What's the red stuff? Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know what the, you know, it's got these kind of rings, these kind of red yeah. rings coming out of the center of I don't quite know what that that is. Kind of strange structure there. Uh, here's uh, NGC fourteen thirty three, uh, which um, has this uh, sort of unusual ring. You know, not only does it have the sort of it's like two rings. You know, this kind of ring of star formation in the outer part of the galaxy. And then in here, not so much going on towards the middle, but then at the center, you get this nice ring of a kind of miniature, almost a miniature spiral here towards the center. So it's very kind of unusual. Is there another galaxy, galaxy. nearby it? Maybe it had an interaction? Yeah, yeah, it could be. Something like that? Yeah. Kind of pass through the middle? Could be a, a merger, perhaps. Mm -hmm. A relatively recent merger, perhaps. And uh, here's um, Steve Stephens Quintet, again, a, also a pretty popular target with amateur astronomers. We've got um, five galaxies, um, 290 million light years away in the constellation Pegasus. And so, a great example of a uh, galaxy uh, collision. In progress, so you have here's the two galaxies on the right here, are in the process of running into each other. And so um, uh, I forget which um, which galaxy. I think I forget if it's this one or one of these is actually not mem a member of the group. They're not gravitationally bound. It's uh, just happens to be here nearby in the sky. 
just not a true member of the of the group. But mm -hmm. um, so there's uh, Stefan's quintet. Nice galaxy collisions. Here's uh, so here's one of the uh, web uh, deep fields. Uh, web deep fields, and so um, I want to say uh, off the top of my head, I think this is an exposure that's about twelve hours, something like that. And so the web was able to accomplish in hours what the Hubble would take days to do. It reflects so much more, so much more light. So this is um, well. It's, it's of course it's infrared, so it is um, uh, somewhat false colored. I think they've probably shifted a little bit to, to make it pretty looking. I think. You can see some of the um, uh, some of the Einstein ones. Yeah. So distorted yeah. images, lensing, yeah. little lensing, so we've got through some lensing here, here and there. Yeah, okay. yeah. And that's probably where some of these arcs are coming yeah. from this galaxy, to the set for the center there. It's better on that screen. Yeah, it looks better on the oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. screen as in terms of the, it's in the projector. Uh, so that's a, a 12 and a half hour long exposure. Uh, but uh, let me, um, let's see, can I do this without messing things up here? Um, they just released just a, about a week ago, another deep field. So let me actually just stop the chair here for a moment and switch over to the website here. Let me um, share the website there. Here it is. And if you look at this, uh, this is called the um, James Survey, which was released about about a week ago. Uh, this is the Jade Survey, and uh, the Jade Survey is kind of like a super duper deep field project. Uh, they're taking 32 days of telescope time, and so they're going to be looking uh, at making some very deep exposures for 32 days and make sort of this mosaic that they're building. And uh, this particular, there's only one frame of the survey and it has 45,000 galaxies in it. Yeah, we should look at the 45,000 galaxies yeah. in this one image. So once, once it's done, boy, it's, there's gonna be a lot of galaxies in there. There's gonna be a lot of galaxies in this survey. It's called the Jeans survey. I just see them get 32 days of scope. Well, that's yeah, that's a major commitment of, of time. And so that's just uh, how important this is as far as the project. There's probably a huge group of scientists that are working on this particular survey. Uh, but it's a big part of the, you know, one of the main science goals of the telescope is to do this, you know, these kind of deep field type things is a major goal for the telescope. And so they, you know, until they're pretty serious about that. Again, like 32 days of your massive telescope just to that. That's a pretty major commitment there. So, um, back to the color. Hmm? How would they make color science? What would they base it on? Oh, well, I mean, it's, you know, based on wavelength and, you know, um, yeah, probably depends on what exactly they're doing and which instrument they're using, you know, but uh, just like any false color image, you have some kind of palette that you decide, okay, well, the short wavelengths are going to be this and the long wave is going to be that color. And you kind of, you know. So there's a predominant um, you know, wavelength in that, in that, in that particular galaxy. Yeah. Maybe we just decide that orange to it or green or blue yeah yeah you know um it's like well the, the hubble they're doing the same thing with the hubble images because some of those hubble images are combining some little bit of ultraviolet sometimes they're including a little bit of infrared in there and they're gonna have to do the same thing with the hubble images kind of assign what kind of colors you want to, to those there's a whole kind of standard 
Hubble palette that they, they use. It's a kind of a standardized palette they use. For this. That does this to yeah. find the color that they wish. Yeah. Because in what we would see here, this would all be black. Yeah. That's not useful. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, in this case, in front of, unlike Hubble, this is all infrared. And so right. almost, I, I think the, the shortest wavelengths that Webb can view are the far red end of the spectrum. And so this might look a little bit of red, and that'll be about it. If we try to look at it all in visual wavelengths, it would be mostly black because of a little bit of red, you know. There, be there are it. some dimensions where they'll actually make the shorter wavelengths blue and yeah. the longer wavelengths redder even right. though right. Re I mean, visually they may actually appear mm. red you know yeah. Yeah. but you know yeah. Uh, yeah. that's that's often mm. what they do but not all the time yeah, yeah they just they can choose they, they choose the colors sometimes based on contrast yeah. uh, and sometimes uh, based on other data yeah. <clears throat> it's not always arbitrary but sometimes yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, here's an example of the uh, the spectrum of these uh, galaxies. And as I mentioned, we really want to find the most distant galaxies, the, um, the youngest galaxies in the, in the universe. And so, if you're looking at a galaxy that's uh, say 11 million light years away, the spectrum might look like this. So we've got some spikes of you know hydrogen and oxygen. If you look at that, a galaxy that's uh, almost 13 billion light years away. Well, you know, the, the, the spectrum has shifted down to the red end of the spectrum. And so you can see the lines are shifting off to the right with longer wavelengths. Here's, uh, or here's 12.6 billion, there's 13, and then here's 13.1. You see that the, uh, the, the emission lines have been shoved all the way down uh, towards the long end of the spectrum, the red end of the spectrum. And so uh, that's what they're looking for. And I think the, the record right now, uh, there's a, a galaxy in the Jade survey uh, that I just showed you. Uh, the redshift is 13.2 uh, is the highest redshift uh, recently found, which means that it's 13.6 billion years old. Uh, or a billion light years away, I'm sorry. And so that means only about 200 million years after the Big Bang. And so that's um, very puzzling. And that's a bit of a conundrum because uh, I don't think anyone thought that galaxies could form that fast. You know, only 200 million years, that's not very much time. And then, yeah, so there's a little bit of a conundrum here there that it, it seems like the galaxies that they're starting to find with the Webb Space Telescope uh, are surprisingly large and complex, much more complex than they thought. So it's a bit of a conundrum. How, how did this happen? How do these galaxies form so fast? You know, so it's a bit of a, a bit of a puzzle. And so um, if you want to see uh, new images, uh, you can go to the uh, James Webb Space Telescope uh, website. And there's uh, also another website that's really, you know, because the Web Space Telescope is run by the Space Telescope Institute, which also runs the Hubble. And so uh, you can go, there's another website on the uh, uh, Space Telescope Institute as well, uh, but uh, it has some more information about, some more details about the instruments and that sort of thing you can check out. Uh, but uh, check it out and see what uh, new images uh, are coming down from the telescope. Uh, by the way, in the meantime, um, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope is still operating. It is 33 years old, and so it won't last forever. Um, but uh, if they want to uh, extend the life of the Hubble, you, it needs a boost. And if it gets too low, it, it'll drag, the atmosphere will drag on it, and it'll fall out of orbit eventually. Uh, and so, um, you know, when they did the last servicing mission with the Hubble, they did attach a, a docking port to the back of it. Uh, the idea being that eventually they could deorbit um, the, the well, space or, But that's the idea is that, well, what if we boost it? What if we have a little automated spacecraft that would go up and dock with that docking port and boost it back up again? 
uh, and then you'd be able to extend it uh, a little bit longer. Uh, uh, so I, so there's a, a company called Astroscale that has a spacecraft that they're developing uh, that they think that they can do it. And so that's something they've been have proposed to NASA and uh, uh, I don't know how seriously NASA is considering it, but uh, and it's a possibility that uh, we can extend the life of, of Hubble. Uh, the one thing that uh, this will not help is the uh, reaction wheels, the gyroscopes. Mm -hmm. And those have gone bad, you know, on occasion, you know, sometimes they don't last quite as long as we would hope they would. I think, I think Hubble's down to three working gyroscopes, if I remember correctly. Uh, it can work on one. Uh, if you lose two of them, you can still work on one. It's kind of limited to what motions you can do, but uh, it can still operate on, on one gyroscope. But it's much better to have all three working. So half, I think it's, has, I think it's six. And it's three of them have stopped working over, over time and they're down to three at this point. So uh, that's kind of a limiting factor, I think, uh, more than anything is the computers and the gyroscopes, uh, or how long those are like. So that's, uh, this might be possible, but uh, we'll see how it goes. But it'd be cool if they have both Hubble and Webb continuing to work together uh, over time. That'd be kind of a nice thing. Uh, someone has even proposed, uh, and I don't quite know how they're going to accomplish this. Uh, someone's even pr proposed react reactivating the Spitzer space telescope because mm -hmm. that does the far infrared. And I, you know, I don't know how they're going to do that because it's out of coolant. And so, how would you recharge the coolant uh, in a system that was not designed to be maintained or, or, or repaired in, in orbit, you know? So I don't know how, how realistic that is, but, uh, but so no one's talking about it. So we'll see, how, we'll see what happens. Uh, so, uh, so, there, so there's a um, little update on the uh, Webb Space Telescope. And so I hope you uh, enjoyed that. And uh, do you have any other questions about that? Uh, Fourth um, scope is part of the, the project in the very beginning. You mentioned it was in the upper left. Yeah. Screen, uh, CR, GL or uh, that was the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. I've and never heard about that. I've never seen anything. It was, um, I think, um, relatively, I, I don't remember exactly the years that it was operating, but. Um, it was um, relatively short-lived, I would think. You know, kind of like Spitzer, it had a limited amount of coolant and fuel and that sort of thing. Um, um, it was after after Hubble. I don't remember exactly when, but it was because Hubble was the first of the four, and uh, Compton Gamma Ray Observatory went up after that. Uh, but that um, was deorbiting. That's no longer uh, burned up. So. Kevin, how long was Hubble actually supposed to work? Yeah, probably like a 10 years, something like that, yeah. you know? Something like 20 years, but it's oh, way over there now. Really, so oh, yeah. Kind of, it was at least, yeah, at least 10, but oh, yeah, yeah we got our, our money's worth. It's amazing how crazy it's been in the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, sir. Uh, what's the uh, expected mm -hmm. lifespan of the JWST? Uh, at least one to already extend out the next lifespan. Yeah, for for Webb would be, um, oh, yeah, they're talking about twenty years. You know, they they figure that they have about twenty years of of fuel uh, left for that. Um, actually, speaking of which, um, what's next? Let me scroll back down again. I think I yes, here we go. Uh, let me show you this. Uh, this is um, what will fly the next, this is the next space telescope. And um, uh, this is now known as the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, which is really nice. Uh, she's known as the mother of the Hubble Space Telescope. She was the, if I remember, the first chief astronomer for NASA. And so she kind of shepherded that whole project uh, into, uh, into being. And so it's kind of nice that she got a space telescope named after her as well. 
this you may have heard of this telescope. This is um, something that uh, somebody found in a warehouse. Uh, one of the, uh, I forget which organization, one of the intelligence agencies that I was looking around the warehouse and said, uh, hey, you know, there's, there's two spy satellites here. Uh, and gee, you know, they have the same optics as the Hubble Space, or almost the same optics as the Hubble Space Telescope, except for their short, their shorter focal length. So they um, the first time? What's that? Did they work the first time? Oh yeah, they, they worked. They just uh, apparently didn't need them, and they're sitting around in the warehouse somewhere. Gee, NASA, do you want this? And NASA said, well, yeah, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, sure, we, we can use one of those. So, uh, so they took they took both of them, and and this uh, this initially was known as the W first project, and now it's it's known by the name of George Stroman. Uh, and this is also infrared, uh, but a much wider field of view, uh, and so they neither Hubble or Webb. And so this is a nice uh, infrared survey telescope that can be used uh, for um, other projects, and hopefully that will fly and be in operation in a couple of years, 2026 to 2027, uh, this will fly. And so um, it's kind of nice. You have Hubble and Webb and the Roman Space Telescope all operating at so the same time. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, like I said, it's similar, similar optics to Hubble, I think, but just a shorter focal length, so wider, wider field of view. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what's next after that. 